Oh, yeah. two, two outs. All right, guys. Game. Yeah. I was uh, trying I'm to bring on our special guest. One. Hey, Tim, our special guest has made it through. I don't want to keep him waiting. So, uh, everyone, give a warm welcome to Mr. Danny Nobler. Uh, how are you doing tonight, Danny? Good. How are you guys doing? Uh, uh, fantastic, man. We're excited uh, that you joined the show. Uh, we appreciate the work you do, and uh, we, we've each got a few questions for you, so I think I'll start sure. it out. Uh, I live in Chicago, and... Um, I want to know what your opinion is of the current Cubs organization, and do you fall into the the school of thought that they should be backing up the truck with this trade line, this trade deadline coming? I don't know that they can. I mean, I'm not sure how much they have that is um, that is going to bring in a lot uh, in return. So. I, I mean, I think they would like to make some deals. I think they realize they're not going to win right now, but they're not a team that has a lot of. Uh, they have the, the guys that they would probably like to get rid of have big contracts that aren't going to go anywhere. And uh, Ramos Ramirez probably has some trade value, but has a no trade clause and uh, has suggested that he doesn't want to go anywhere. So I, I'm not sure that they can do that many things. I think they would probably like to. Uh, Make some changes, but you can only you can only trade players someone else wants, and you can only trade players who have in many times who have contracts that that reflect their value. Okay, and then my secondary question on the Cubs uh, to you, sir, is uh, uh, how do you feel about the way Jim Hendry has performed as a general manager during his tenure uh, with the Cubs? Well, uh, you know, when uh, it, that's a complicated question, and there's it, it's easy to say that he's not doing a good job right now, and that the Cubs are a mess right now, and that part of it is contracts that he gave out and decisions that he made. On the other hand, Jim Hendry also built a team that won 98 games one season, if I'm not mistaken, and went into the, they didn't do well in the playoffs, but they went into the playoffs as maybe the favorite in the National League. And uh, in the years since then, he operated under quite a few constraints too because of the ownership change. And there's always it's not impossible to win when you're undergoing an ownership change. The Texas Rangers went to the World Series last year, and they'd been in bankruptcy court, so it can be done, but it's also more complicated because you don't have the uh, flexibility. And, and the Cubs in the last few years, until the Ricketts family took over, uh, while the sale was going through, they had very little flexibility. So it was a little bit, in some ways, hard to uh, evaluate him. But I think overall, you've got to evaluate them by evaluate them, and, and Jim has said this himself, you evaluate them by winning. If a guy's been around that long and he hasn't won, it's probably time to try somebody else. Uh, yeah, that uh, man, I couldn't agree with you more. A great assessment. Now, uh, i got two more questions for you, then I'm going to turn you over to Tim and AC. Um, my first question, now this is <laughs> another complicated question, but um, your opinion, because I know you've got a real good feel for, you know, all these trade rumors right now with the trade deadline coming up. What What's the highest impact trade that you feel is the most plausible that uh, we could look forward to happening, or, or maybe let me rephrase that. Well, which player do you think is most likely to be moved that would be a high impact player? Well, I think there's two very high impact players that are being talked about widely now, and, and I think the best pitcher who is being talked about widely right now is Ubaldo Jimenez. He had another good start tonight for the Rockies, uh, and there's no guarantee he's going to be traded, but there's a lot of teams interested in him, and he is. A high impact pitcher. He, we're talking about a guy who, at the start of last year, was unbeatable. Now he hasn't been as unbeatable this year. His record is not nearly as good. His velocity's been a little bit down, but he uh, pitched very well against a very good Braves team tonight. He, he seems to have got he seems to have gotten himself together. He would be the highest impact pitcher, I think. You never know what could come up at the last minute, but that's been widely talked about now. But both, by far, I think the biggest impact hitter who has been talked about openly. Now, there may be other guys who people have talked about 
we don't know. We haven't been reported, and I haven't heard about either. But the one we've heard about, the one we know we about, and we expect for sure to be traded is Carlos Beltran of the uh, of the Mets, and and I think he will go somewhere. There's another very high impact player on the Mets, Jose Reyes, but it appears that they're not that interested in trading him. Uh, and if they were willing to trade him, he would shoot to the top of the list even ahead of Beltran. But at the moment, it appears the Mets aren't that interested in, in moving him. And as a result, uh, you'd probably say Beltran is the number one guy uh, who's out there available among position players. Okay, Danny. And then uh, my final question for you, uh, probably a, a different question than maybe what you're used to getting. Um, uh, you've covered a lot of stories uh, throughout sure. your career. Uh, what was the one that really hit home with you the most? What was what was your favorite story to cover? I, I don't know if there was one favorite story, uh, but I'll tell you the uh, the. the Derek Jeter 3000 tip, the way that all came down a few weeks ago, was one of the cooler stories to cover. Um, because of the atmosphere in the ballpark that day, because the, the idea that he would hit a home run for his 3000th hit, given the way he's played this year, and that he would go 5 for 5 and drive in a winning run, it, it, it was just, it, it, it was one of those uh, kind of crazy things. And uh, that was a lot of fun. But there, but, when when you do this job, there's plenty of them. I mean, uh, I, I mean, I, I go back, I go back a long way. I go back covering the uh, 1991 World Series in Game Seven, the one nothing game with Jack Morris in his one year he played uh, homecoming year with the Minnesota Twins uh, and, and winning the World Series there. That was a great story. There, 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 there's just there's there's a lot of them, but that was uh, that that was certainly one. Okay, and then before I turn you over to Tim, Danny, uh, why don't you let the listeners know, because I know you're available through various uh, media outlets and Internet outlets, why don't you let our great listeners know uh, where they can find you? Well, uh, they can find me at cbssports.com, and uh, that that's the best place to look on our baseball page. They can also find me on Twitter uh, at dnobler, D-K-N-O-B-L-E-R, and uh Either and if they find me there on Twitter, they'll get links to uh, things that I write on CBSSports.com also. So that that would be the best place to look for me. All right, beautiful. So uh, thank you, Danny, and uh, go ahead, Tim. All right, uh, Danny Nobler again of CBS Sports. I appreciate you coming on, man. Uh, you you basically touched that Beltron's the most likely to go. Where do you oh. see him ending up? I, I think it's too hard to know for sure right now because there's a lot of teams interested. But I think there are uh, there, there are quite a few places he could end up going. Uh, the, the, the Giants have been uh, one of the most aggressive teams all along on him, and they made a move today for Kepinger. But they need to improve their offense, and Beltron would be a definite improvement to their offense. Uh, there, there's some people have talked about Detroit. People have talked definitely about the Phillies and the Braves. People have talked about the Red Sox. Uh, I know there's been also talk now about even the Pirates. I, I think there's a lot of possibilities, especially because the Mets have suggested to teams that they would be willing to pay part of Beltran, part or maybe even a lot of Beltran's contract, now depending on what player they got in return. But they may also not need to do that. One of the things that's happened in baseball is that the sport is pretty healthy financially right now. And whereas a few years back you saw teams dumping players and just trying to get rid of salaries, and you said you heard it in July of no team being able to take on money, you're hearing now about teams that, at, at least in the case of a player like that, can take on salaries. And not all of them. The Braves uh, have some real restrictions. Uh and the Phillies talk about restrictions, although I think they end up being able to do some things when they want to. But uh, there, there is that ability to do things. Uh, and you're talking about because the Beltron right now is probably a step above any of the other hitters who were available, uh, I think it's going to come down to which one of those teams becomes most aggressive. I think the Mets will let it play out probably uh, – 
for another week. We'll get probably close to the deadline, maybe within a, two, three days of the deadline. He does have a no trade clause, so they I don't know that they want to go right to the deadline with him. They might want a little bit of time to uh, make sure that gets taken care of. But they I, I don't think – I don't think it's something we're going to see in the next day or so. You never know. Maybe someone makes a great offer and says, give it to us today, and here it is, and the Mets take it. But because of, there's so many teams involved, I think it's more likely to go for a few days. Uh, my question, I may see um, with Tim and Bruce and everybody here, I want to thank you personally for coming on. Um, with you saying Jose Reyes um, is most likely – not trading, not being traded at the deadline. Uh, do you think he will resign with the Mets? I, I think not, but I will say that there is certainly a greater chance than there was when the season started. Uh, the, the big unknown on that is what the Mets' financial situation will be like at the end of the year. Will have they gotten the Madoff suit solved by then? or at least to the point where they really feel like they can justify spending some money right away. Because the way Jose Reyes is playing right now, he's going to get a gigantic contract. A lot of teams are going to be interested in him, and he's a difference maker. So it's going to be a huge contract. And he loves playing in New York. He would love to stay in New York. But he also is going to want to get a good contract. And for... uh, for, for Jose Reyes, to, for the Mets to sign Jose Reyes, they're going to have to have enough financial flexibility. Now, they've taken care of some of it. They got rid of uh, Francisco Rodriguez, and an option that really wasn't that big a deal as it turned out anyway once he changed agents. They're going to move Beltran, although that might not end up saving them that much money. They are they're going to have some other contracts off their books. They might be able to do it. I, I, I still have my doubts. But uh, I, I, I certainly have to acknowledge that it's not impossible anymore. It, it, there, there are ways. Things have happened since the start of the season, both with the Madoff suit and with the Mets. Their attendance has been up a little bit. Certainly Reyes' performance and how much he means to the fans here. There, there is a, there's certainly a chance where there wasn't one before. All right, and with that, the Yankees now are going after some pitchers, too. And we've heard guys like Hiroki Kuroda and Jeff Francis come up. You know, are they going to go get a starter? Are they going to go after a lefty specialist? Who do the Yankees end up with pitching-wise? I I don't think they're going to go after – I I may be wrong, but I don't think they're going to go after Jeff Francis. I I, I think – and Hiroki Kuroda probably doesn't want to come that far, and I don't think he would be – Really, uh, at this point, I'm not sure him how much of an upgrade he would even be for the Yankees. Uh, I, I, I think that if they go after a starter, it would probably be Jimenez. And they they have not so far shown an inclination to give up the players it would take. They have enough players to get Jimenez, but they haven't shown an inclination to give those up. They may go after a bullpen guy. Maybe they go after something smaller. You never know. They th- one of the things about the trade deadline is things change by the day, and someone a team is interested in today might they might not be interested in tomorrow, or they might be interested in today and two days from now, but not tomorrow, because so many things happen because you play games every day. So to predict today they're going to get this guy for sure, I think is silly, but I think. Uh, what you could say is they they have been out there looking at plenty of different guys, and uh, they look they've looked at some starting pitchers. They certainly have looked carefully at him, and uh, they've also looked at a lot of relief pitchers. They were in San Diego last week looking at Heath Bell and Mike Adams. It wouldn't shock me if they did something like that. Um, maybe they go get a utility infielder, a Wilson. Betamit type to go and uh, play third base in Alex Rodriguez's absence, but I don't think that happens. But we'll see. All right. Um, realistically, could you see a guy like Ubaldo Jimenez 
or uh, possibly even Derek Lowe end up in Detroit and uh, be productive and possibly it's lead very, to the very, playoffs. It's very, hugely unlikely that Derek Lowe will be in Detroit. Uh, they haven't shown a lot of interest in Derek Lowe right now. Um Jimenez they have interest in, but it's pretty unlikely they would get him too because they really don't have enough to get him. Uh, they want a starting pitcher badly. They may very well get a starting pitcher. I doubt very much it would be one of those two. Uh, maybe they get somebody else. Uh, I, I, I don't know yet who it will be. Uh, they've tried on a lot of different guys. They're going to continue to try on a lot of different guys. They don't have a ton to offer, and uh, we'll have to see. But they are trying. That They very badly want to get a starting pitch. Again, guys, we're talking to Danny Nobler, head baseball reporter for CBS Sports. Uh, one guy that I guess isn't on the forefront of trades but could be out there is Colby Rasmus. Is he basically untouchable to the point where you have to blow them away with an offer, or could you – See him being moved. Uh, they keep saying they don't; they're not interested in moving him. Now, uh, his name has come up a few times. I don't know that it's impossible he would get traded, but they've said over and over they don't intend to move him. So I, I think we have to take them at their word on that until we see otherwise. Uh, but th- his name has certainly come up. It, it wouldn't be a shock, but. I think it would be a little bit of a surprise at this point. With uh, Hunter Pence's name being thrown around a lot, out there a lot, um, do you think he'll stay in Houston? What do you think will happen with Hunter Pence? Uh, I think it's very possible he'll get traded. The Astros are so bad right now that they have smartly said basically anybody's available. And the problem with it is with the ownership change coming down there, and the general manager realizing that he's probably not going to keep his job, he's probably going to try to make it a uh, make a deal that's so good that maybe uh, he convinces the new owner he should stay. And those are hard deals to make. And sometimes they just what ends up happening is they don't get made at all. So I wouldn't be surprised if Hunter Pence ends up staying in Houston, but he's definitely available. Everybody on that team is available, as it should be. It's a very bad team right now. And I would assume that the same thing basically goes for Michael Bourne, correct? Everybody's available. All right. Uh, Everybody on that team is available. But but that doesn't mean that that they'll just give anybody away. It just means that their their position is make us an offer. All right, and then you go to the San Diego Padres, obviously – we touched on uh, two relief guys they have available, Mike Adams and Heath Bell. Is it possible that both these guys go? Who's more likely, and where do you think they end up? There's uh, quite a few teams that have been interested in both of those guys. Uh, I, I, it's hard to know whether they would prefer to trade one or the other. Uh, I think probably, uh, I think they'll probably trade who they can get the best deal for right now, and maybe both if they can get great deals. And also Ryan Ludwig, uh, his uh, teams have asked about him. Any of those guys are possible. There's quite a few teams that have asked about all those guys, and we're just going to have to wait and see. All right, Danny, I got a caller here, Don, who's got a question for you. Go ahead, Don. Uh, Danny Nobler. Hey, Danny, how you doing tonight? Good, Don. Great to have you on the Blitz, man. Uh I'm a uh, shameful Mets fan. I'm sitting here in my room with my bag on my head. Been a tough uh, stretch for us here. We thought we'd get a nice kickoff, you know, the new city field, the $650 million behemoth. Thought we'd get a nice push off that, but we've had anything but that. We've got the billion-dollar lawsuit hanging over the team's head. Uh, first question is, have you heard any progress on that lawsuit? And... Uh, can you talk about the new person that the Mets have brought in to infuse cash and how he's got some clauses that if things don't go well, he could become a majority owner? Do you have heard anything about that? That's definitely true. Uh, uh, so the word is they, they did get a good favorable ruling in the lawsuit where they got it moved from one court to another. There's more of a chance that 
maybe that they won't be in for as much money, and that's good news for the Wilpon family uh, and their hopes of keeping the Mets. The the minority owner, David Einhorn, has put up some money. It hasn't been the contract apparently hasn't been completed, but I think it will be. Uh, that basically what that's doing is two things. It's giving an influx of cash to get them through. They had real cash problems. That helps them get through, gets, get, helps them pay off some loans. Now, what it does also is it gives them a few years to get things together. And, yes, he has a chance to become the, my, the majority owner, but basically he can only become the majority owner if the Wilpons can't get their finances in order in the next few years because they don't want to give up the team. And if they can get things together, if they can get the lawsuit behind them, if they can get uh, if they can get their feet under them, then they can probably have enough money. And we don't know the details of the contract between them and Einhorn. For one thing, it hadn't been completed. But for another, the reports, are, there's a lot of conflicting reports, and people will tell you that probably none of them are exactly right. So, uh they're basically what it comes down to is they need to get their feet under them in the next few years. That involves yeah. partly getting that lawsuit out of the way, settling it or or getting it thrown out or whatever. For but getting it without having to pay anything close to the billion dollars that Picard went after, and then it involves uh, getting the team in better financial footing, and that prob and that certainly involves lowering the payroll. And, and there's I, yeah, I. e. not paying uh, Bobby Bonilla money each year still. Yeah, he, but isn't that's Bobby, not, you know what? Bobby the, Bonilla, go ahead. The Bobby Bonilla money was from long ago, and it, 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 that, 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 that's it, teams do that. You know, it got a lot of attention, and it was the only the only thing that was bad about it was that they set it up because they thought they they thought it was a great deal because they were putting the money away in the Madoff funds, but teams teams do. Just for yeah, money, yeah. and overall, in the Mets payroll, in the Mets budget, that's not very much money. The money that's about hard money is the Jason Bay money, the Johan Santana money. That those, yeah. that's the money that really hurts them. Not the Bobby yeah. Bonilla money is small potatoes compared to that. It sounds, yeah. it's, it's yeah. a nice fun story, but it's the big contracts <laughs> where they're not that they're not getting anything out of right now. Those are the ones that are hurting them. And it's when their attendance goes down because they're not performing. That's when it hurts them. So they need to get well, things we, going. They, they need to find a way to both get their payroll down a little bit, but all, but do it at the same time that they keep their team somewhat competitive so that they keep people going to the ballpark. That's a hard trick to to perform, but they've got to do it. Well, we've, got, we've gotten rid of um, <clears throat> Dumb and Dumber, Manuel and Manaya, so... I think the team has energy this year as a fire. I know Bruce is a um, Chicago guy. There's a lot of love for Jerry Manuel in Chicago, but apparently what he did over there in the AL didn't manifest itself in Yano because he was awful, and he didn't. He never lit a fire under that team. But I got one more question for you, follow up, if I could. A little bit of controversy, conspiracy theory here. Talk about what baseball, you know, Major League Baseball had a big problem with some of its uh, records being compromised, you know, the sanctity of uh, Roger Maris, the sanctity of Hank Aaron, those those records being smashed out the window under the um, black cloud of, you know, performance-enhancing drugs. Last year we saw a huge amount of no-hitters, potential no-hitters last year. Can you talk about how baseball, Major League Baseball, possibly juiced down the ball? Talk I haven't heard that. Well, I mean, over the years have – I mean, you I, can start I, I, I haven't heard time. nobody talking about that. I mean, maybe you have, but I haven't heard anybody talking about that. But you can go back early in the game how how the composition of the ball has changed. And, well, if you're uh, going hundreds of years ago, yeah. But I, I think if you're talking about within the net last ten years, I have not heard anybody talking about that. I'm sorry. Well, how do you explain all the no hitters last year? There's lots of you know what if you have an hour I'll talk about it. There's uh, there's a lot of things that went into this to do. There, one of them there's cycles in the game. Things happen. There's a lot of outstanding pitching in the game right now. If you look at the draft, if you look at the minor leagues, if you look at the futures game, 
There are more good young pitchers than there are good young hitters at this point. That's the cycle of the game. You also have bigger ballparks right now. You have uh, the, the lack of performance-enhancing drugs certainly has part of, has some effect. You have yeah. the, the, all those things fit in. There's a huge number of reasons that pitching has become more dominant in the last few years. You're absolutely right. It has been. But to, to say that baseball tried to do that, I think that's – I have not heard that from anyone. Danny, if I can piggyback on that, and, you know, Don brought up the sanctity of a lot of these records. How do you quantify, you know, what do you do with the metrics when it pertains to guys like a Barry Bonds and these records that he broke? Um, You know, do we erase everything he did? Do we blanketly say that, you know, despite the fact that he was probably – at the least, at least the second ballot Hall of Famer before he started enhancing his performance, uh, do we, you know, as fans, do you think we should demand that these guys are shut out of the Hall of Fame because they cheated? It's all up to you. That's th- Those are very, very, very difficult questions, and I don't think you can say that one way is right or wrong. I think it's a matter of... Y- it's it's your tolerance for the use of performance enhancing drugs and for cheating in the game. And yes, they cheated the game. Now, we've had over the course of time many other things where players cheated the game in many different ways. You had for a long long time, well before the use of performance enhancing drugs was used, you had amphetamines which kept, which allowed players to play more games and allowed them to go and play day games after night games often, definitely affected the game. You've had guys cork bats. That's happened over the course of the game. You had uh, pitchers uh, mess with the ball, spit balls or, or scuff the ball, do many, many different things. Some of those guys are in the Hall of Fame because of it. So it's there's a long history of it. There, you can argue if you want, and it's certainly a legitimate argument, that doing that through use of drugs is different. But that's a decision everybody has to make on their own on how they feel about it. And, no, you can't erase records. Things are out there. I think one of the silliest things is to try to take records out of the book. The NCAA does it, vacated championships. What in the world does that mean? You vacate a championship. It happened or it didn't. And you can't take you can't take away what already happened. You can say, well, what what you can do is you can qual- uh, qualify it. And when you talk about it, and I think this will happen, and it already does happen, it will happen for a long, long time, is to say that when you talk about what Barry Bonds did, you say that he did it with the use of performance-enhancing drugs. And there's nothing wrong with saying that. And by saying that, I think you're doing all you need to do. I don't, I don't think you need to take records out of the book. All you need to do is remember how they were, uh, how they were compiled. Well, I like that answer. And it's funny, Tim. That was very similar to the one I gave you last week. But, um, but Tim, why don't you go ahead? I, I, I know you've got one final question, and AC has one, and then we'll let Danny who's been so kind with his time here, uh, get some rest. So go ahead, Tim. All right. Um, the final question I have, and then AC's got one, is about uh, the Reds. I saw a report on uh, MLBTradeRumors.com, and I think you might have actually put this out there, that the uh, Reds are looking into guys like Wandy Rodriguez, Sean Figgins, and Coco Crisp. What, which one of these guys is most likely to end up as a Red? Well, we'll have to see. They're also looking at Ubaldo Jimenez, and they have enough talent that if they want to do it, they could probably get Ubaldo Jimenez, but it would take a lot. It's a question of whether they want, they're willing, their tolerance for giving up players. Right now, the question is, what do they need the most? The last two days, they've gone to Pittsburgh, and they haven't scored a run in two pretty important games. So maybe what they need is someone who's going to jumpstart their offense. Now, Sean Figgins has had a terrible two years in Seattle. 
but he was a pretty good leadoff hitter in Anaheim. Obviously, if they were to get him, the, the contract is a big contract still, and Seattle would have to eat a lot of the contract to make anything work. But it might be a gamble worth taking. Coco Crisp, at times when he's been healthy, has been an igniter a little bit for teams. The Reds have not really had anyone to ignite things at the top of their order. That may be something they need to do. Wandy Rodriguez is a pitcher they've looked at, no question. Wandy Rodriguez also has a big contract, and we don't know how much Houston is willing to eat of it or what kind of deal they're willing to make. The Reds are out there looking. I expect the Reds will make maybe one or two trades. Walt Jockety knows what he's doing. He's very good at this, and they know right now that they need to make a move. They're falling a little bit behind in the National League Central, but it's a very winnable division. They know they don't have enough right now or may not have enough right now to win it. They might try out and go out and get something to do it. All right, and AC, final question. Oh, you know what? I think uh, he dropped off. Let me get him right back on. Go ahead, AC. There we go. Yeah, my uh, just killed the call, I guess. Matt Garza, seven innings pitch, four hits, one earned run tonight. Um, is he at all going anywhere, or what do you see with uh, Matt Garza? I, I don't think he is. Uh, that. I think it would be interesting if somebody came and tried to make a big offer for him. But Jim Hendry made that deal last winter. It was a signature deal for the Cubs. And the reason they made the deal, and they gave up a huge number of prospects for him, they made the deal because Matt Garza was under control for several years. I find it hard to believe. First of all, if he was going to trade him right now, he would have to, I'm sure he would feel like he had to get a return every bit as good or better than what he gave Tampa Bay to get Matt Garza. I don't know if somebody's going to be willing to do that right now. And if he, it would kind of negate the purpose of the trade. When he made the trade, the whole idea was it's hard to get a top-of-the-rotation pitcher, and they had a chance to get one. I think if to give one away right now, um, uh, it, would, it would basically be admitting that not only can't they win this year, but they're not going to have a chance to win for a few years to come. And I don't know that Jim Hendry's willing to do that. No, I, you know, being a Chicago sports fan, and I, I'm one of those, uh, Danny, I like both teams. You know, uh, okay. a lot of fans have the rivalry going, but I like both the, the Cubs and the Sox. And I see that same tendency out of the Cubs that you're talking about. They, they do not want to admit... Or even that you will never hear the word rebuilding uttered <laughs> out of Wrigley Field. But uh, thank you for your time, sir. It, it's been a okay. pleasure. Very educational. Good, and good uh, to you guys. Oh, good, yeah, good hopefully we can do this show. again, Danny. Good luck with your show. All right, thank you, sir. Okay, bye. Well, that was a great interview, guys. That was the longest oh, well. interview I think I've ever done. All right, let me uh, 